We'll continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> We're in the second chapter. Uh, just to draw your attention just for a few moments uh, to journey back. Uh, does anybody remember what the key verse was? You got it marked in your Bible? Anybody? Anybody remember what the key verse is? 45, 10, 45, okay. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, and remember, that word ministered, if you want to make a note or in your margin or underline, if you mark in your Bible, it really it gives us the word that we get our word deacon from, okay. Uh, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, Okay. And uh, we've started out, we've journeyed through here. We saw uh, his, really, uh, Mark doesn't mention the birth of Christ. He goes straight forward because he's going to present him as a servant. Uh, and he starts out uh, with his baptism as he identifies. Uh, John uh, identifies him as the Son of God. Uh, we know that he went out into the wilderness and he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and we know that uh, he overcame Satan and then we find as he came back to begin his earthly ministry, uh, he went into Capernaum uh, and he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he began to preach and teach. Uh, and when, as he made his journey through, remember there's a span of about a year, a uh, year of lapsed time when you get to between uh, verse 15 and verse 16 and he calls Simon and Andrew uh, and the, uh, those others, James and John, who were fishermen, their dad Zebedee, uh, was probably the boss of the show. Uh, but anyhow, they left that fishing industry and they began to be fishers of men. Now, as you begin to get to chapter 2, uh, we've seen that he, uh, chapter 1 con concluding, uh, he preached in the synagogue throughout Galilee and he cast out devils and uh, he had a counter with several. He had an encounter with a leper. He cleansed him and uh, what amazing fate that was. Uh, is he accomplished that uh, miracle in that uh, individual's life and some others as well. And then we get to chapter 2, in verse 1 through verse 12. And we begin to see he entered into Capernaum again. Verse 1 says, After some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to, re to receive them, not, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, uh, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. I want to speak tonight, as you notice on the title of your outline, Through the Eyes of Jesus. First of all, have you ever wondered why Jesus went into the wilderness to pray? Well, keep in mind that people were beginning to follow him by the masses. Uh, only pretty much they followed him for, uh, to see the healing of the sick, uh, for the casting out of demons. Uh, they'd never seen anything quite like this. Uh, uh, when they should have been seeking enlightenment, they were only wanting to be entertained. Therefore, he often took time away to be refreshed and be revitalized through prayer. 
because he knew their hearts. He knew what he was dealing with. He knew why they were coming. They weren't coming for uh, to to understand the gospel, to understand that he was the Son of God, uh, that he was the Son of Man. They were coming once again to be entertained. Uh, they enjoyed seeing these healings. They they actually enjoyed him preaching and teaching because he spoke with authority. But Jesus makes it clear in this next section that he came to really do three things. As you get through chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, he came to do three things. First of all, he came to bring forgiveness. Secondly, he came to bring fulfillment. And thirdly, he came to bring freedom to individuals who will seek him by faith. And that's what we see in these unique stories in chapters 2 and chapter 3. First of all, I want you to notice... Looking at this event that we're looking at through the eyes of Jesus, what do we discover? First of all, I want you to notice under your number one, uh, he looked up. He looked up. As you read the first few verses, he looked up. Uh, and again, he entered Capernaum, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, when many were gathered in so much that there was no room to receive them, not so much as about the door, he preached the word unto them. And they come to him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, and when they couldn't get to Jesus for the crowd, verse 4 says, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when he had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Again, he looked up. Well, stop and think for just a moment about these four men. Think about these individuals. They knew that Jesus was going to be teaching there. Word had got out that there's, there's been noise that Jesus is in the house. Some say that it may have been a, a Peter's house. I don't have all the evidence of that. There's pretty good indications. But they've heard that he's going to be in, he's in the house. He's teaching. Uh, and uh, the Bible says he preached the word unto them. That word preached is a very interesting word. Uh, in the Greek language, it really means that he, uh, he sat down and he taught. He began to break things down and he made it simple. He, it's a different word you see through the Bible and other places where it means to herald or proclaim loudly. Uh, he began to break down scriptures. He got down to ground level where they were at and he just gave them the, the wrong truth. And they begin to be captivated by that. And, the, and when he's doing that, uh, they bring one sick of the apology, which was born of four. In other words, uh, indication here is that he had four brothers. Don't know whether they were older or younger. Uh, could have been that they were older, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But he looked up. What did he see when he looked up? He saw the determination of these men. I wonder when Jesus looks today, and, uh, does he see the determination in our hearts and our lives to get our family members to Jesus, uh, to get those that we love to Jesus Christ? Folks, if there's ever been a day that, that we need to look up and get determination from the Holy Spirit uh, and from the Word of God, it's the day in which we live. Secondly, we see the, the determination of these men when he looked up, but he saw the expectation of these men. Verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, their faith, well, they brought, listen, they brought this brother here uh, to this occasion uh, because of faith, their faith. They believed, uh, they had heard, they had believed and probably even seen what Jesus has been doing and they believe what he's doing and they respond. The expectation of these men. I wonder when we come to church, do we come with expectation? Do we come with expectation to see God do something in our lives? Do we come with expectation to hear God say something in our heart and our life? Do we come with expectation for God to show up and show out? Folks, if we're not careful, we can lose that expectation and that determination that these men portray for us. Well, then look at the communication of these men. Stop and think about it for just a moment. Uh, verse 4 says, When they couldn't come nigh uh, for the crowd or the press, they uncovered the roof where it was. And when they had broken it up, I can just see this bunch, this bunch of uh, uh, Pharisees, these spirit, uh, this religious bunch sitting on the front row. Uh, they had probably had front row seats knowing Jesus was going to be in the house. And here they are, and they're sitting here. And they begin to see that roof falling apart. Can't you just imagine just for a moment and just see their, their faces? But he uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. 
They begin to let him down. Stop and think about it just a moment. We see their determination of these men, uh, the expectation of these men, but thirdly, the communication of these men. Can you just imagine now as they're letting him down, he, it's a pallet, of course. Uh, many of you know what, like a gurney or whatever with uh, two handles and you got one, one person on each, one brother on each corner and they're, they've got him up, they've climbed to the top, roofs were flattened that time, they begin to chip away, they pull back the, the things that were protecting the, the inside, they moved it back, whatever it took, and they begin to let that bed down so that Jesus can see uh, the, the need of this brother. Uh, the communication of these men. Keep in mind, each man had a corner. Can you just imagine for just a moment with me the scenarios if they'd been in competition? One's trying to get up the ladder before the other. Uh, and when they get up there, uh, one of them decides, well, I'm going to get him down to Jesus first so that Jesus can see what I'm doing. Can you imagine him rolling off of that pallet into the floor uh, and, and a great big flop the whole event would have been? No, these guys were in unison. There was one on each corner. Uh, listen, they weren't in competition. They, can you imagine if they'd been critical toward one another? Well, you're not carrying your part of the load, or I'm carrying more than you're carrying. Folks, they weren't none of that. The, the communication of these men are, is so prevalent here. Why? Because they know that their brother has a serious need. And by the way, this palsy, he was sick of the palsy, which is a representation of, really, of sin. But he had a greater need. He wanted just the apology it was sin. We'll get to that in just a moment. Stop and think about some things here I don't think I put in your notes. Uh, as we think about these, he, he, Jesus looking up, and he sees these men uh, with this brother. trying. He sees their determination, their expectation. He watches their communication of getting this brother down to him in front of him. Uh, first of all, Number one, they were concerned enough to get their brother to Jesus. And folks, we ought to be concerned enough about people's lostness to get our family and our friends uh, to Jesus Christ. Secondly, they had faith enough to believe that Jesus would and could meet his need. Folks, we have to have faith enough to believe that, that God's going to save people. He's going to minister their hearts and lives and draw them to a relationship. That's why we pray. And that's why we put legs on our prayers. Thirdly, they didn't simply pray about his condition. Uh, they put feet to their prayers. Uh, they just didn't simply pray about their brother's need or his condition. They did something about it. They got him to Jesus. And fourthly, uh, they didn't let difficult circumstances discourage their efforts. You know, everybody's not going to be excited about us trying to help them. Everybody's not going to be excited when we tell them what, what Jesus has done for us and what He can do for them. Everybody's not going to be enthused and excited about the things of God. But they didn't let difficult circumstances discourage their efforts. I go ahead and tell you, if you serve the Lord long enough, there's going to be some times in your life when you're going to get, let, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to get discouraged really, and really if you watch other people and what they do and how they do it because people will let you down, but Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never let you down. And, and lastly, they worked together and dared to try something different. Nobody probably had even thought about chipping that roof away. Nobody had probably even thought about shimmying up that ladder, each one of them grabbing a corner and chipping that roof away and letting, listen, and letting their brother down in the presence of Jesus. They worked together and they dared to do so or try something different. Well, he looked up, but I want you to notice he also looked down. He looked down. Look at verse 4 and verse 5. It says when he... Uh, they could not come nigh unto him for the press. They uncovered the roof where it was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the sick, let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the under the sick of the palsy, "Son, thy sins be forgiven thee." Uh, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. So uh, we see the seriousness of his sickness. The Bible tells us that he was sick of the palsy. That little word palsy means to be loosed on one side. Uh, it actually means it means to, the stroke of God is what it refers to. Uh, so we see he was in a difficult situation. And Jesus looked down. He looked up, but he looked down also. 
And he saw this man's condition. And aren't you glad one day uh, that Jesus looked down and he saw my condition and he saw your condition when you come to Jesus Christ? The seriousness of his sickness. But look at the source of his sickness. Uh, the Bible says in this text, uh, as we think about the source of his sickness, he was sick of the palsy. He said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, as you begin to read that, keep in mind, I want you to remember something here. Listen, not all sickness is caused by sin in the person's life, okay? But evidently, according to this scripture, the context of this scripture, uh, and by the way, John chapter 9, verse 1 through verse 3, uh, there's a, a, a great account over there. And there's some folks came to Jesus one time and they asked him a question. Uh, remember that? And Jesus passed by and he saw a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, he said, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. So as you read that scripture and understand that not all sin, all sickness is caused by sin in one's life. And as we read that, there was an individual here that was born blind at birth, and, but God was using that blindness for a distinct divine reason so that people would be drawn to Christ. Well, notice in this story, evidently as you read the scriptures of the Mark chapter 2, this man had sinned. And sin evidently was the reason for his condition. That's why he was in the state he was in. You see, somebody said this, as you think about for being forgiven. As Jesus looked down and he saw his condition. You see, forgiveness is the greatest miracle Jesus ever performs. It, meet, it, meet, it meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. And it brings the greatest blessing and most lasting results. You see, Jesus looked down and he saw the seriousness of seriousness of his sickness he saw the source of his sickness the source of his sickness was a result of sin in this gentleman's life and then thirdly I want you to notice he looked within as you begin to look at verse 6 as I've read some of it already these scribes were sitting there and they were reasoning in their hearts they begin to argue and debate that word reasoning means to it means to debate it means to be critical and they begin to ask some questions. They said, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, why reason you these things in your hearts? Can't you just imagine their jaws dropping? And they're saying, how in the world did he know this? <laughs> you see, Jesus saw this religious crowd sitting and soured by what he was doing. Uh, they had front row seats and they were here. Here he is, he's preaching, he's healing, he's forgiven sin and they're trying to be critical. Look at verse 9. And they begin to debate and they said, he said, why reason you these things in your hearts? And look at the question. He says, let me just go ahead and resolve what you're arguing about and what you're debating over. He says, you whether it's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. You see, here's what he's dealing with. You see, the scribes had a doctrine, folks, uh, that said that no sick person could ever get well until he was forgiven of his sins. And Jesus said, okay, I'll prove my power to forgive sins in the realm of the invisible by showing you my power in the realm of the visible. That's what he was doing. He looked within. He saw their hearts. And then fourthly, he looked ahead. In verse 11 and verse 12, notice it says, he said, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately... Immediately he arose and he took up the bed and he went forth before them all. Insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God saying we never saw it on this fashion. 
Now, as we read this, I, I wish we could say that all those sitting there being critical, I, I wish we could say that uh, all those sitting there being critical and pondering these things in their heart, trying to reason, debate, and argue uh, who Jesus really was and how this was happening, uh, all came to Christ. But folks, you, you'll find these same folks over there, to, over there when they're nailing to the cross. Over there putting that crown of thorn on his head and, and spitting in his face and mocking him and ridiculing him. And, and, paying the, and paying those guards to do what they did. He looked ahead. He saw, the Bible says, notice he says he went forth. He went forth. He took up his bed and he went forth before them all. You see, Jesus saw a young man's life whose life had been crippled by sin and now he's been healed and he's been restored. He could now give glory to God for the great things that He had done. And folks, we, we too ought to give glory to God for the great things He had done in our hearts and lives. You see, here's the bottom line. Had these religious leaders opened their hearts that day, they would have learned that sin is like sickness and forgiveness is like having health restored. Uh, what, an, what an opportunity they had. <laughs> but they came with a critical spirit instead of a receptive heart. And they missed his forgiveness. You see, Jesus saw the hearts, and he sees our hearts. Stop and journey back for just a moment in conclusion. Jesus saw the hearts of four faithful men, four faithful brothers. Jesus saw the heart of a paralytic who wished more than anything that he wouldn't have to lay there any longer every day in that bed. Jesus saw the hearts of the Pharisees. He saw their faulty reasoning and he saw their, he, he saw their foolish rationale. And can I remind you and I, he sees our hearts too. And as we look at that story, it reminds us, yes, he looks within. He looked up. He looked down. And we need to remember, because of what he did, we can look ahead by faith. Amen? So uh, that's the, in a nutshell, this second. So we see a lot through the eyes of Jesus. That's this. Uh, but notice verse 12 as he closes. Look what they said. They were all amazed and glorified God. Say, we never saw anything like this. You see, they'd seen what dead religion had done, but now they've seen what it means to be, have Jesus the Messiah to touch and to heal and to help. Uh, to see a, a man literally, uh, literally come up off that pallet and go for, as a witness before them all in so much that it, they were amazed and they glorified God. You know, when God does something like that, you know, He ought to get the glory. Amen? And when God does something in our hearts and our lives, He ought to get the glory too. When He, when he raises us up from the, bedness, the bed of sickness and death, in our, taking us from a life of uh, trespasses and sins, He ought to get the glory for what He's done in and through our lives. Why? Because He's the only one that can take us from that lame condition that you and I are in spiritually. We too are in a sense... Uh, like this one that's sick of the palsy, needing somebody to bring us to Jesus. Thank God for the people in my life that was concerned about my salvation. Thank God for preachers who preached, for, for a grandmother, for parents, uh, for Sunday school teachers who was concerned enough about me to commit their lives to teaching and living for Jesus. All of them had a part. They all had a corner. And as I think about their lives, and I think you, you can speak of people you know, but think about your life. Let me encourage you, take up that corner that God's called you to and do what He's called you to do and let watch Him work in and through your lives as you try to impact other people's lives. Well, that's the message tonight. Uh, powerful, powerful story as we're going to see Jesus in action as He continues to move through this territory. And uh, we're going to see some great things that He's done. But let me encourage you. Let me encourage you as you leave. Uh, don't ever get over the amazement of what God's done in, in your heart and life as He's delivered you from the lame condition of sin that you were in. Don't ever get over it. Don't ever get over uh, the amazement. And don't ever quit glorifying God over what He's done and what He's doing in and through your life. 
When you do, when you do, it'll be very difficult for people to see Jesus through your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your goodness, for your kindness. Uh, thank you tonight, Lord, for all that you've done for us and all you're going to do. Thank you for this great, great story of how you uh, moved through these men's lives. And Lord, the great truths found in this second chapter. Lord, they're so challenging not to all of us. And Lord, may we come with the intention and with the desire uh, to, to look for something encouraging, exciting to happen in the house of God. May we, in the days to come, look and, and see you work and move and say, we've never seen anything like this. Well, I believe that's what revival would be like, Lord. If we'd see the hand of God again in our churches moving uh, through our hearts and lives. And Lord, I pray, Father, that as we go out in this world, that people will look at our lives and they'll know that there's something different about us. They'll know that Christ lives in us. And they'll know that something phenomenal is happening in our hearts and lives by the way we live and conduct ourselves. May they, may they be amazed at what God has done as we glorify God in our lives. So much that they'll, they'll live in amazement. And they'll want the same thing we have. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for saving us. Lord, bless our evening as we go home. And again, I pray you begin to prepare our hearts for worship on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh,